Hello everyone. Welcome back to the video portion of the Summer Math Packet. I'm Mrs. Pecholante and we will be completing numbers 33 through 40. Uh, once again, we have myself, Ms. Bazo, and Mr. Schuler. So let's see, we are asked to factor completely. What we want to do first is take out a common factor. So we see here that 5 and 20 are both divisible by 5. We can factor out a 5. And we have an x squared with an x, so we can factor out an x as well. That leaves us with x minus 4. So this is already completely factored. It's basically a distributive property in reverse. Let's try the next one. Same idea. 7 and it goes into 7 and 21. x squared goes into x cubed and x squared. So that's my highest monomial that I can factor out, leaving me with x minus 3. And that's completely factored. OK, the next one, we have a quadratic. So here we're going to use foil and reverse. Probably you have learned other techniques for factoring, but I like to just use FOIL in reverse. We're going to place x is here so that our first terms multiply to give us x squared. And then we're going to play around with two numbers that multiply in this spot to give us a 64. Well, I'm going to try 8 and 8. And uh, sure enough, when I do outside terms, I would get 8x. And when I multiply inside terms, I would get 8x. And that does add up to 16x. You might have recognized this as a form for a perfect square trinomial. All right, the next one in D is also a special form. It's a difference of two things that are squared. So this factors as x minus 7, x plus 7. Should we call C x plus 8 squared? We call what? C x plus 8 squared. Uh, we can leave it like that, or we can write it as a perfect square. I think your math teacher wouldn't really care which form it's in. Okay. Okay, next one. So we're going to factor again by placing x's there and coming up with two numbers that when we multiply them, they give us 72. So let's see. 72 is a pretty big number, I know. Let's try... Well, maybe the easiest would be 9 and 8. Everyone knows 9 and 8 multiply to give us 72. Uh, now we would want the outside and the inside terms to add up to a negative 1. So we would place the negative here and the plus over here. And just to check, first terms this times this is x squared. Last terms, negative 9 times 8, negative 72. Outside terms, positive 8x, like this. Inside terms over here, negative 9x. Sure enough, that adds up to negative 1. It's good. Okay, next one. Gets a little bit harder. Why? Because we have that 3x squared. No problem. To multiply the first terms to make a 3x squared, we would need a 3x and an x. And here now we need to place the last term so that they multiply to give us a 2. So let's try a, t a 1 here and a 2 here. And now we would want a um, negative 5, so we'll place the negative here and the plus here. And now we're going to test outside terms multiply to give us negative 2, negative 6x. And inside terms multiply to give us a 1x, and yes, that does add up to the negative 5, so we know we're good. Next set. Okay, so next set starting with letter G. So we have x squared plus 7x plus 12. So luckily this time we don't have any values in front of the x squared. Our a value is just equal to 1. So our guess and check, we're just going to look for two numbers that add up to a positive 12. I'm oh, sorry, that multiply to a positive 12 and add up to a positive 7. So you're back into 12, you've got 1 and 12, 2 and 6, 3 and 4. The pair of those add up to 7 are positive 3 and positive 4. All right. 
Okay, now coming over to letter H, 2x squared minus x minus 15. So now we've got a number for our x squared again. So we're going to need to do some guessing and checking. But thankfully, 2 is a prime number, so the only th uh, possibilities we have for that first spot are 2x and x. And now we've got to pick something to go into these two spots so that they multiply to give us negative 15 and add up to a negative 1. So looking for factors of 15, probably I'm going to need a 3 somewhere in here and a 5. Okay. So if I try maybe a plus 3 and a minus 5, if I multiply these out my middle terms, my outside terms are going to give me a negative 10x. My inner terms are going to give me a plus 3x, but I double check this and uh oh, this gives me a negative 7x. That's not what I want. I want a minus 1 here. So I'm going to have to change this. i got a different guess in here. Okay, so maybe I change this. So maybe instead I put in a sort of swap these around a little bit. So let's say this time I tried a plus 5 and a minus 3 in here. I kind of switched them around a little bit. So now if I look at my outside terms, my 2x times my negative 3, that's a negative 6x. And my middle terms, the 5 times x gives me a plus 5x. Now this time I do get at negative 1x I want in the middle. This is the correct factor factorization for letter H. All right, moving down to letter I. X squared minus 8x plus 16. So now this time, so I got both my x's here. Don't need to worry about any values of the A in front of x squared. So I'm looking for factors of 16 to add up to a negative 8. And this case, that's going to turn out to be two negative fours. Negative four times negative four does give me uh, 16, and they add up to a negative eight in the middle there. Or you can also write this as x minus four squared. <clears throat> okay, letter J. Now we got some really ugly stuff to deal with because now we've got a negative six in front of my x squared. So I'm going to have to deal with not only the fact that I have a number that's not equal to 1 here, but also the fact that I have a negative here to deal with. So I usually don't like to deal with negatives when I'm factoring this kind of problem. So I'm going to factor out that negative first. I'm going to pull out this negative here. I'm going to write this as 6x squared. But since I'm pulling this out as well, I also need to change this plus 3x to a minus 3x. And I'm also going to change this plus 3 to a minus 3. So what that's going to do for me is now I'm not going to have to worry about this negative when I'm factoring. And now I can just worry about, okay, I'm going to need factors of 6 and factors of negative 3. And we have to arrange those so that I get what we started with. All right, so first I need factors of 6. Is it what 6 I need? in the directions? You can mm -hmm. take out any common factors. Ah, yes, three. thank you. Sorry about that. So I forgot. I forgot to read my own directions up here. So it does suggest that we pull out any common factors. So in this case, I do have for those three numbers, 6, 3, and 3, I can actually pull out 3 from each one of those. So I'll do that as well as point out that negative. So I'll change this here. Okay, so I'm going to first write my negative 3 out here. And now when I apply this negative 3, instead of having a 6x here, 6x squared rather, I'm going to have just 2x squared left. And then some point out a negative and a 3 here. This is just going to be a 1x. But you don't have to write the 1 there. You just leave that as just plain minus x. And this is going to be a minus 1 here. Okay, so now, now we're looking at pulling out factors of 2x squared and negative 1. That's going to have to a minus 1 in the middle there. So I'm going to have 2x on one of these and an x on the other one. And negative 1 
pretty easy. I just you have a one here and a one here, and I just need to figure out which one has to be positive, which one has to be negative. So let's say I try to have this as a plus uh, two x plus one here and an x minus one here. So if we just double check that this is equal to what we started with, this would give you, I have my 2x times x, that's 2x squared. My 2x times negative 1 is minus 2x. 1 times x is plus x. And 1 times negative 1 is minus 1. If I, oh sorry, it should be a negative 3, not a negative there. Sorry about that. that. All right. And if I combine this in the middle, this is negative 3 times 2x squared minus x minus 1. And multiply this out. This gives you what we started with at the beginning. Negative 6x squared plus 3x plus 3. So this would be correct factor for that. Okay, moving on to letter K. X squared plus 10X minus 24. So we're looking for factors in there, 24. Add up to a positive 10. So factor of 24, we've got 2 and 12, 3 and 8, 4 and 6. Was add to a 10 are going to be so normally you would have a 4 and a 6, but we do need 1 to be positive, 1 to be negative. So in this case, I want to have a plus 12 and a minus 2. Since my middle terms then will add up to a 10x. And letter L. So I'm looking at these two terms. They do both have a factor of 2 in common between 2 and 6. So I'm going to factor that out first. They also have an x in common. I have an x squared and an x here. So I can factor out 2x. And then this is going to be, when I factor out this, I'm still going to have a negative x left over here. And I'm going to have a plus 3 left over there. Okay, next section. We haven't finished our factoring yet. We get more factoring. And when we read our hints again, it tells us to remember difference of squares. So when we look at a, t a 4 and a 49, we want to think about the fact that those are squares. So we have a 2x and a 2x and a 7 and a 7. And when we do the difference of squares, we need a plus and a minus. It doesn't matter if you put the plus first or the minus first, as long as you have one of each. When I look at this one, I have no common factors. 3 goes into 3 and 6, but not 11. And this is a leading coefficient of a 3. So we need a 3x and an x. When I'm factoring, I like to think about what goes into that 6. And I kind of like to write them off to the side, just to make sure that my brain's working. So 1 and 6 give me a 6. 2 and 3 give me a 6. I need things that add to be negative and multiply to be positive. So I know my signs have to be negative, negative that will have me add things to be negative and multiply things to be positive. So I need some combination of these things to give me 11. So I like to think about where can I put this? If I put a three here and a two here, what would happen? Well, I'd have a six on the outside and a three on the inside and a six and a three is not gonna work. So if I put a 6 here and a 1 here. I got a 3 on the outside and a 6 on the inside. And that's not going to work either. What if I switch my 2 and my 3? What if I put a 2 here and a 3 there? Then I have a 9 on the outside and a 2 on the inside, and that's going to give me what I need. So I need a 3 here and a 2 here to give me the 9x on the outside and the 2x on the inside to give me that 11x that I'm looking for. Back here, I see squares again. So I need a 9x and a 9x. I need a 1 and a 1. And I'm going to just switch them up and make this one minus and this one plus from the last one to remind us that it does not matter what we do. 
on letter P, we need a 3x to begin with and an x. And then we need factors of 5. I really like this one because I see if I put a 5 here and a 1 here, I see what's going to happen for me there. I see a 3 on the outside, I see a 5 on the inside. So that's going to give me the 8 that I need. I need a positive and a positive, so I just need positive symbols. So I have the 3x on the outside, the 5x on the inside, gives me that 8x. Q is reminding me of n just because I had that leading 3 in the middle 11. So I need a 3x and an x again. And this time I need factors of 10. My factors of 10 are 1 and 10 and 2 and 5. And I need to mix them up in some way that I get the 11. And I have to use this pair together or use this pair together. I can't mix those up. So 3 times 2 is 6, and 5 times 1 is 5, so I've got a 6 on the outside and a 5 on the inside, which gives me that 11 that I'm looking for. This last one on this section, I can see a common factor of 3x. So I'm pulling out a 2x squared minus x minus, just kidding, that's not a 9, minus 6. So 3 times 2 is 6, 3 times negative 1 is negative 3, 3 times negative 6 is 18, x times x squared is x to the third, x times x is x squared, x times no more x's is just the x. Now I have to ask myself, can this factor more? So I'm going to put my 3x down, I need a 2x and an x. These signs are trickier because this is negative and this is negative which means I need a positive and a negative someplace to get the negative in the middle and the positive at the end. I still have factors of six, so I still need some combination of one and six or two and three. If I put a three right here and a two right here, I get a four on the outside and I get a three on the inside. So if I have a negative four and a positive three, that's gonna give me the sign that I need. If I have negative four on my outside, F-O-I-L, and three X on the inside, I have negative four plus three to give me negative one. All right, so here we are finishing up number 33 with factoring. And you may have noticed that they were getting a little harder each time. So these two are the hardest of all. Well, maybe not. Okay, so we're gonna begin again by placing the first term so that they multiply to give us a six x squared and we'll just go with a two x and a three x. And now, uh, as mentioned before, it's very easy to place these last terms to multiply to give us a five. The choice is one with five. Well, if we just eyeball it, if we put a five here, it's gonna multiply with the two to give us a 10. And so the one goes here to multiply with the three X to give us a three X and then 10 plus three is going to give us the 13. And these signs are both plus again, because that's a plus and that's a plus. Okay, next one. We want to factor so that the first terms would multiply to give us a 2x squared. Let's try a 2x and a 5. Now we need a, uh, two, the two numbers in the last spot multiplied to give us a negative 12. So one will be negative and one will be positive. And we want the outside plus inside terms to add up to a negative 7. So we can think of placing one with 12, or two with six, or three with four, in such a way that we would have the numbers add up to a negative seven. So let's go with the middle ones, four, let's try four and three. Uh, well, we might have to play with the signs. Let me see, I'm gonna do this a little bit differently. I'm going to put the signs later. I'm going to play with the numbers first. I told you these were hard. 
All right, let's see. So if I put a four here, that's going to multiply with an eight, and I could put a three here, that's going to multiply with a 15, and I can work with 15 with an eight, because if I do 15 minus eight, I get seven. So it's going to be a minus over here for a negative 15, and a plus here to give me that positive eight. Okay, moving on to solving quadratic equations. So our directions say we want to solve each one by factoring. It does specify a method for these, so we want to use that method whenever it tells us to do it a specific way. So the first one, 2x plus 1 times x plus 3 equal to 0. So if I want to solve this, we're going to use something called the zero product property. This is just a fancy way of saying if I have two quantities that I multiply to give me zero, at least one of those two quantities has to be itself equal to zero. So if I know this, that means I must have 2x plus 1 equal to zero, or I must have x plus 3 equal to zero. At least one of those two things has to be true. So now if I know this, I have broken this up into two simple linear equations that we're all used to solving. First one I can just subtract 1 and then divide by 2, that gives me negative 1 half. That's one solution. And the other one I can just subtract 3. That's going to give me negative 3 for the second solution. Okay, for letter B, I have x squared minus 16 equal to 0. Now you might be thinking, okay, well why can't I just add 16 and then take a square root? And this one, we do want it solved by factoring, so that's what our directions tell us. Well, we want to follow directions, so in this case, we're going to factor first. This does factor into x plus 4 times x minus 4, since 16 is a perfect square. And then once I have it set up like this, that means x plus 4 is equal to 0, or x minus 4 is equal to 0, which is going to give us negative 4 and positive 4 as our two solutions for letter B. Okay, letter C, x squared minus 3x minus 10 equal to 0. So again, we're looking to factor this. I want factors of negative 10, that give me a negative 3. So 10 only has two pairs of factors, we have 1 and 10 and 2 and 5. Only pair that's going to give us a negative 3 is the 2 and the 5. And we want to have a negative, so that means our negative is going to go with the 5. And we're going to get a plus with the 2. So that means we break this up, we're going to have x plus 2 equal to 0, or x minus 5 equal to 0, which means we're going to have x equal to negative 2, and x equal to 5. And for letter D, so looking at x squared minus 6x equal to 0, this one I do have a common factor here, so I always want to do that first. I have an x in common with both of these terms. So I'm going to pull that out first. And what I'm going to have left is x minus 6. I always want to look at what I have left to see if I can factor this anymore. x minus 6 is a uh, factor as much as we can make it, so we can just go ahead and set both factors equal to zero. Now the first one I'm already done, I already have x equal to zero, that's one of my solutions. And the second one, x minus six equals zero. If I add six on both sides, that's gonna give me x equal to six as my second solution. As we keep going, letter E is a much fancier kind of factoring. It's the kind where we have to have a 2 in the front and an x in the front to figure out these factors of 15 that add to give us negative 13. The nice part is we know we need a negative and a negative to give us the negative when we add and the positive when we multiply. So factors are 1 and 15 or 3 and 5. If I put the 5 right here, that gives me a 10. And the 3 right here gives me a 13. So there's my factors. So 2x minus 3 equals 0, 
or x minus 5 equals 0. That one's a one-step equation. That's pretty easy. This one we have to remember to do are two steps. We need to add the 3 first to both sides. So when I add 3 to both sides, I get 2x equals 3. Then I need to divide by 2 to get x alone. And I get x equals 3 halves, or x equals 5. Letter F. Not nearly as scary because I don't have a leading coefficient. I need an 8 and a 1 to give me a 7. I need a positive 7, so I need 8 to be bigger than 1. So x minus 1 equals 0, or x plus 8 equals 0. So x equals 1, or x equals negative 8. Down here I have a 4x squared, and that kind of ran into my writing, sorry and a 24x, so they have a 4x in common. And that leaves me with an x minus 6 is 0. And just like Mr. Schuler said, we're going to make sure that we have no, nothing in common. If we saw a 2 to begin with, if we saw a 2x, we would see that they still had a 2 in common if we had a 2 and a 12. So I want to make sure it's completely factored. 4x and x minus 6. So 4x equals 0, or x minus 6 equals 0. Divide by the 4, x is still 0. Add the 6, x is 6. Okay, so here the directions have changed now. We are going to solve these quadratic equations by using the quadratic formula. Well, let's write down the quadratic formula. X is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. In this problem, a is equal to 2, b is equal to negative 3, and c is equal to negative 2. So after we have identified those coefficients, we simply substitute it into the formula. So we have x is equal to, well, a negative negative 3 will be positive, plus or minus the square root of a negative 3 all squared will be 9, minus a 4 times a, which is 2, times c, which is negative 2, all over 2 times a, so that's going to be 2 times 2. So I decided to write out all the numbers nicely for this first problem, and maybe I'll cut down on the writing for the other problems. All right, so we now have 3 plus or minus the square root of, over here we will be multiplying 4 times 2 times a negative 2, so we are getting um, 16 out of that, but it's going to be a plus 16 since we're multiplying a negative with a negative. So we've got under our radical here, 9 plus 16 all over 4. Okay, so we just continue to simplify. 9 plus 16 is 25. And now the square root of 25 is 5. So I'm getting two answers by adding 3 plus 5 and then dividing that by 4. 8 over 4, which is 2, and then subtracting 3 minus 5 and dividing that by 4. So that gives me negative 2 over 4, which is negative 1 half. So these are my two answers to the first problem. For the second one, same thing. Plug in this time A is a 1, B is a 5, and C is positive 6. So we have negative 5 plus or minus the square root of B squared will be 25 minus 4 times 1 times 6 will be 24 all over 2 times A will be 2. So this is square root of 1, that's a 1, so again we're doing negative 5 plus 1 divided by 2, 
and we're doing negative 5 minus 1 divided by 2. This gives us negative 4 divided by 2, which is a negative 2. And this gives us negative 6 divided by 2, which is a negative 3. So those are our two answers for part B. Okay, so part C, x is equal to negative b, that will be positive 4, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which will be 16, minus 4ac, which will be plus 4, all over 2 times a. a is 1, so we get a 2, so this is now four plus or minus the square root of 20 all over two. All right, in the last cases we had perfect squares under the radical, but now we do not, so we simplify the radical by thinking of 20 as four times five. So this simplifies to two root five. And now we can simplify by dividing 2 into 4 and 2 into 2. So this becomes 2 plus or minus the square root of 5. So a little note on the side. This is a, um, a place where many students make a mistake. The 2 must be divided into the 4 and the 2 root 5 because think of it this way. If you were to split this up, this is what it would look like. And that's why the 2 is not only divided into the 4, but 2 root 5 is divided by 2 also. So our final answer is right over here. Okay, moving on to the next one. Well, I'm going to draw some partitions here so as not to make it confusing for you. Okay, so we're going to substitute A, B, and C again into the quadratic formula, and this will be X equal to 8 plus or minus the square root of, I uh, would get a 24. I'm kind of skipping steps here because I know that you get the idea. All right, we're going to simplify the square root of 24. 24 is 4 times 6, so this becomes 2 root 6 all over 4, and again, we're going to divide uh, not by 4 this time because the most we can divide each of these is by 2, so that's what we're going to do. 8 divided by 2 is 4, 2 root 6 divided by 4. Oh, sorry. Uh, 2 root 6 divided by 2 is 6, and 4 divided by 2 is 2, so it's like that. Okay, next section. Now that we're all thoroughly sick of quadratics, we have some more quadratics. This time we have solving by square roots. All right, so now we have, so these are two problems that are pretty nicely set up for us. We just have sort of a single binomial that is raised to the power of two equal to some plain number. So whenever we have something set up like this, we can go ahead and just take a square root of both sides. So if you want to write it out like this, we would have x minus 7 squared equal to the square root of 81. Now also don't forget when you take a square root of a number like this, also need to make sure you include a plus or minus along with it there. So the next line is going to go like this. We're going to have x minus 7 equal to plus or minus 9. From here, I personally, I, I kind of like, at this point, I would kind of like to write this as two separate expressions just so that we avoid uh, making any errors here. So I'm going to write this as x minus 7 equal to positive 9. I'm also going to write x minus 7 equal to negative 9. So now we can clearly see we're going to get two solutions. And we both have some, uh, some nice linear equations. We're just going to add 7 for both of these. So the first solution, we're going to get 16. And the second solution, 7 added to a negative 9 is going to give us a negative 2.
And uh, letter B, it's the same basic idea. Take the square root of both sides. So I'm just going to kind of jump to the second step here. I'm going to write this as x plus 5 is equal to plus or minus 8, since 8 is the square root of 64. And then we're going to get two solutions here. We're going to have x plus 5 equal to positive 8. We're also going to have x plus 5 equal to negative 8. Subtracting 5 from both is going to give me 3 for the first solution, and it's going to give me negative 13 for the second solution. Number 37 says, for the items below, determine the side of the right triangle that is marked with an X. And as I've taught geometry more years than I can count, the first thing I always say is make sure that you mark your right angle and the side across from it, because that's when you know that that's your hypotenuse. So when you set up your A squared plus B squared equals C squared, you know that C is the one that's across from the right angle. So on this first one, we're gonna do five squared plus 12 squared is x squared, because that's gonna fill in. It doesn't matter which one's A and which one's B, but it does matter which one we call C. It has to be the one across from the right angle. So 25 plus 144 is x squared. So 169 is x squared. So x is 13. We're not taking a negative this time because we're talking about a side length. And we don't tell people that you go negative 13 miles to your house. So we don't talk about side lengths as negatives. On this one, we're going to do 7 squared plus x squared is 10 squared. Because a squared plus b squared is c squared. So 49 plus x squared is 100. So we're going to subtract 49 from both sides of our equation. Find out that x squared is 51. And we're going to take the square root. And if we had our calculator sitting right by us, we would figure out that the square root of 51 is a little bit more than 7. But we can leave it just like this. And again, remind ourselves we're not taking the negative because it is a length. Okay, in this problem, we're working uh, backwards. We're going to determine whether the triangle is a right triangle. We're not given that it necessarily is a right triangle. But what we're going to do to determine this is use the Pythagorean theorem. We know that in a right triangle, a squared plus b squared has to equal c squared. And we may have observed that the hypotenuse, which we label c, is always the larger of the two. So we're just going to check whether this statement is true. Does 12 squared plus 16 squared equal 30 squared? 12 squared is 144, and 16 squared is 256, and 30 squared is 900. When we add 144 and 256, we get 400. 400. Thank you, my colleagues, for helping me out. Nothing like doing mental math at the board. All right, so we see, lost my little question mark, that this is not true. And therefore, no. These lengths do not make a right triangle. Okay, next one. Same process. 2 squared plus 3 squared. Does that equal 4 squared? Well, that's a 4, and that's a 9, and that's a 16. So, no. 13 does not equal 16. Not a right triangle either. All right. Next section we're looking at finding the distance between the points we're given. So this time, instead of using the Pythagorean theorem, we're going to use the distance formula. So let's remind ourselves of what that looks like. We've got D for distance, and that is equal to the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. So basically what this is saying is we're just taking the distance between, I'm oh sorry, the difference between the x values, squaring that, the difference between the y values, squaring that, and then taking the square root of the whole thing. So for letter A, 
I'm going to go ahead and label my points just like we were doing with uh, the slope formula. I'm going to have this as my x1, y1. And then my second point, I'm going to label this x2, y2. And now it's just a matter of plugging everything in. So I'm going to have square root my x2 minus x1, that's going to be my negative 6 minus 7. And I'm squaring that. And then this is added to the difference between the y values, so that's 3 minus negative 2. And I'm squaring that also. So now it just becomes a matter of simplifying this down. So remember, in order of operations, got to do those parentheses first. So my negative 6 minus 7 is going to become negative 13. And the 3 minus negative 2 is going to become a positive 5. All right. So doing some arithmetic here. Negative 13 squared is going to give us 169. 5 squared is going to give us 25. And adding those up is going to give us 194. And if you had a calculator, you could get a decimal version of that, but we'll just leave it as square root of 140, 194 for now. And letter B, same idea. I'm going to label my points x1, y1, and x2, y2. I'm going to set up my formula. So my x2 minus x1 is going to give us 2 minus negative 6. And that's squared. And I'm going to have 9 minus 3 also squared. So 2 minus negative 6 is going to give us 8. 9 minus 3 is going to give us 6. After I've done my parentheses, now I'm going to do my exponents. X, uh, sorry, 8 squared is going to give you 64. 6 squared is going to give us 36. I add those up to give me 100. And the square root of 100 turns out to be a nice whole number. That's just equal to 10. And both of these answers should be strictly positive since, as uh, Ms. Bazo said, distance is only considered to be positive and not negative. So we are now on question 40, which is our last question in this section. And again, I think every geometry teacher last year told you the first thing you need to do is label your hypotenuse, because it's really, really important. I'm going to change some colors here, and I'm going to use blue for angle A, and red for angle C. So when I'm using different colors, then we'll, we'll know what I'm using them for. For letter C, this side, if we go through the angle, this side is opposite. We have an H, we have an O, the HOA collects money for our trash. There's the C, we have a red O and a red A for the opposite side and the adjacent side. Switch colors back to the other blue, and I hope that's the same one. If I use this, this is the opposite side for angle A, and this is the adjacent side for angle A. So when we're trying to think about these things and what we're doing with our item banks, we want to make sure that we know which side is the hypotenuse doesn't change, but the opposite side changes depending on which angle you're looking for. So letter A says the leg opposite angle A. So here's angle A, and we said the thing that was opposite angle A, opposite A, was this one right here. And this one right here is called BC. It has a segment bar on top because it is a segment. We're looking for the leg opposite C. Here's C, here's the thing that's opposite. We put C in red, we put opposite in red, so it's this segment. This segment is called AB, and it gets a segment bar on top. Cosine ratio, we remembered so ka toa. Geometry teacher said it to us so, uh, so much that we wanted them to go away, probably. So we need a cosine ratio of C. So here's C, so we're looking at the red things. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. The thing that we labeled as the adjacent for C is right here. It's BC. 
and the hypotenuse is always going to be AC, so BC over AC is our cosine ratio. We don't have segment bars because now we're talking about a number. This we were talking about a leg, this we're talking about a distance, BC with no bar means the number. We're still on C, so here's C right here, and we're looking for the tangent ratio. And up here we said the tangent was opposite over adjacent. For angle C, the opposite side was AB, so we'll write AB. And we need the adjacent side underneath, and we're talking about angle C, angle C, the adjacent side is this one, is BC. So here, now we can just look at this. It says the sine ratio of A and the cosine ratio of A. So I can relabel this picture just for A. Always start by labeling your hypotenuse. What's opposite from A comes out of A, across from it, that's the opposite. What's left over is the adjacent side. So the sine ratio, so ka toa, is opposite over hypotenuse. So it's BC over AC we labeled our opposite and we labeled our hypotenuse. And right here it says the cosine ratio of A is the adjacent, so ka toa, so it's AH. We put AB over AC because the adjacent side was AB, we labeled it, and the hypotenuse we labeled AC. Over here it says which angle has a sine ratio that's BC over AC. So we know AC is the hypotenuse. So the question is, what is opposite from BC? That's the question. So here's BC, and we already know that opposite from BC is angle A, because we already labeled it that way. So angle A has a sine ratio of BC over AC, which we also wrote right here. And the angle whose tangent ratio is AB over BC. We have an opposite over an adjacent. So which thing is opposite from AB? So I take AB, and the thing that's opposite, if I go away from that, is angle C. Think we're coming to the end. Yes. Okay, so we are looking for the tangent ratio of A. Here's the hypotenuse, here's the opposite, what's left over is the adjacent. Tangent is O over A, opposite is BC. Adjacent is AB, so we have BC over AB. We've been asked the hypotenuse so many times, we can just write it right there. It is a segment, so it does get a segment bar on top of it. Last thing we have to do is the sine ratio of C. These letters are for angle A, so we need to change these for C. So for C, this is the opposite, and this is the adjacent. So for C, we need opposite over hypotenuse for sine. The opposite is AB, the hypotenuse is AC, and we have finished this section. Thank you.